You can put the second reading uh, for today. Um, today uh, we are dressed in rows and the second reading from the first letter of Paul to the Thessalonians, chapter 5, verse 16 to 24, uh, it starts with the line, Rejoice always. Now, that's a tough one. <laughs> How do you rejoice always? I could rejoice here and there when I'm inspired to do so, but always? Uh, how do I do that? Now, let me make a little footnote here. I'm mindful that parents and the family will have a family session after our Mass uh, where we'll talk about preparing our hearts, preparing our homes for the coming of our Lord, for the birth of Christ Jesus. Preparing our hearts, preparing our homes. Of the many ways we can prepare our hearts and our homes, there's one thing specific which is what's called to do today and this week on the Gaudate Sunday is to call on the grace of joy and to rejoice. Now, for you to properly understand why there is a rose candle in our little crown of four, three purple, one rose, we have to go back to years when Advent was celebrated as if it was Lent. Therefore, the same colors. So just as during Lent we do prayer and fasting and giving and, and we do great sacrifices preparing, preparing for the death and resurrection of our Lord, during Advent we should be doing prayer, fasting, sacrificial offerings as we prepare for the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ in His birth. So, Today, the third week, it was like a little break from our Lenten journey, our Advent Lenten-like journey. So this week it was more of a, all right, take a break from all the sacrificial offerings, the penance, and, and now let's rejoice as to get the, the, the last breath of strength to last the last week. Yeah. So that's where, where this rose and joy Gaudate comes. It has to be put in the context of Back then, the rest of the weeks were pretty painful and sorrowful and sad. Now, let's go back to that second reading. Rejoice always. How do you rejoice always? How do you allow in your heart and in your home that grace of rejoicing to reign? I'm interested. I was doing a little research and there was a poll, uh, survey that came up uh, that was sponsored by Camps, Camps Experience. It's a, it's a ministry that helps children who are grieving. And they hired this other company, I think it's Harris Hall, to survey. And they were about, able to survey about 2,000 uh, people in the United States. Um, and something that came out was that 36% uh, of those surveyed 36% uh, didn't feel like celebrating the Holy Days. Uh, and they didn't feel like celebrating the Holy Days because they were experiencing some form of loss, of grieving, the death of a loved one. So during the Holy Days, missing our loved ones who departed gets heightened. So how am I supposed to rejoice in the midst of grieving, in the midst of sorrow. According to that survey, then, I could make a very educated guess that one-third of our community present here right now is grieving. So how do you rejoice? Always in the midst of sorrow, in the midst of grief. The second reading today, I hope you go back home as a way to prepare your hearts and your home for Christmas, opening yourself to receive the grace of rejoicing, the second reading today gives us five bullet points, five things that we can do to allow that rejoicing to happen in our hearts and in our home. So we go back to, can you go one slide back so that they can see whether uh, back, one more, because I want you to memorize this. First letter of Paul to the Thessalonians, 
chapter 5, verse 16 to 24. And from there, I'm now I'm going to draw those five points to help us allow that grace of rejoicing to come into our hearts. Now, let's go. So Paul is calling us to rejoice always, something that seems impossible, but now he gives us how that can happen. The first thing, pray without ceasing. Now, Centuries of Avila speaks of prayer as a dialogue, a conversation with God. So, if Paul is asking us to have a conversation with God, what should you have a conversation about? Exactly that which is causing your sorrow and your grief. See, we often reduce prayer to the recitation of prayers. Our Father who art in heaven, Hail Mary, full of grace. Just recitation of prayers. But if prayer is to be a dialogue with God, and if you're having a conversation with a good friend or a loved one, what should you talk about? Talk about what's in your heart. So whatever is the emotion that you are feeling, that should be the topic of conversation with God. Now, if you're talking to God about your emotions, well, you will never cease to have context and material to pray about. Because we're constantly feeling emotions. And therefore you'll be able to pray without ceasing. No emotion is strange to God. No emotion is offensive to God. Why? Because He created the emotions. And if it was not enough, when He became fully human, He experienced the full spectrum of human emotions within Himself as fully human and fully divine. So no emotion is out of the topic of conversation with God. So first, pray without ceasing and pray with your emotion, pray with your grief, pray with your sorrow. And then it says, the second point, in all circumstances, give thanks to God. Give thanks to God. I, I know there's plenty of reasons why to be sorrowful. But there will be plenty even more of reasons why to be grateful. There is a, a need to exercise as a discipline. The recognizing, the articulating, the validating, of the making conscious of the many blessings that you have. The expression, crown your blessings. That's actually a practice of uh, that once a day to write down in a in special uh, book of the gratitude prayer. This is a beautiful exercise. I highly encourage it. And, and people who practice this, I, they see the difference. Every day they try to list 10 things they're grateful about. At the beginning, they were having a hard time to get to five. And you would be surprised. Oh my God, what? Only five? And then once they get in this habit of recognizing, of being conscious of the blessings they have every day, then it is easy to write the 10 and often beyond 10. But when that happens, as you're doing that exercise of writing, of being conscious of the things to be grateful about, you begin to grow in this gratitude, in this appreciation of the many blessings that are upon you. Careful not to be so sorrowful of the one person that has died that you miss that there are other nine next to you loving you right here, right now. Now, still, I don't want you to ignore your sorrow and your grief. Let it be the context of conversation with God. Now, with number one and number two, then Paul says, for this is the will of God. This is what God wants you to do. To talk to Him all the time, especially about your emotions, and to be grateful for what is given to you, even in the midst of sorrow and grief. This is the will of God. And how do we do it? In Christ Jesus. And that's the line there. For this is the will of God for you in Christ Jesus. We are, in, we are able to do this if we remain in the mystery of Christ Jesus Himself. Now, a little footnote here. Eucharist in Greek means what? Thanksgiving. So as you are here right now, you should have a list of things you want to 
Eucharistize or give thanks to God in the celebration of the Holy Eucharist. We're called to be a Eucharistic people, which means you have to have things you bring every Sunday to be grateful about in the, that will happen during the week. Grateful to God. So, and how do we do this? In Christ Jesus. When we come to Holy Communion in Christ Jesus, in His body, in His blood, soul and divinity, we give thanks to the Father. Okay? Now, let's go to the next point. Oh, I'm sorry. Let's go back one. I missed the other one here. Do not quench the Spirit. You know, and, and I, I'm guilty of this, and this is how I know it. And, and I've seen it in other people. And I want to bring this, this phenomenon to the light so that you'll be aware when you're doing it and after we do it unconsciously. When, when we're grieving the death of a loved one, something happens in us that it's almost like we do not want to be consoled. Even when we want to. But there's something in us like, I don't want to be consoled. Although we really want to be consoled. If you haven't figured out we humans are very complex, let's just embrace our reality. <laughs> this is not a problem we have to solve. It's just, it's just the way we are. We, we are in grief and sorrow. We need and want consolation. But at the same time, I don't want to be consoled. And what's behind it is anger. Now, anger comes to the aid and the protection when we are wounded. When we are hurt and wounded and feel vulnerable, our Hulk comes into the picture and with anger creates a space to protect oneself from being vulnerable. You're hurt, you're sorrowful, you're crying, you're in pain. Here comes anger to protect you that are wounded so that anyone who comes by and close, we don't want to be consoled. Leave us alone. But what's behind that mask is, I need to be consoled. I'm just crying. I'm sad. I'm wounded. So you have to know that that's happening there. And you have to work through the anger to go to beyond the anger, which is the crying us, the crying we the crying loved ones who are out there and who often snap out in anger, leave me alone. Now, if we go back to the beginning of the three, uh, so far the points we've discussed, the first one is what? That's the command. <laughs> but how do we do it? The next one is? Pray without ceasing. And I'm encouraging you to pray with what? Very good. If someone is paying attention to pray with your emotion. Is anger an emotion? Is anger something we could pray with? Can we come with our anger to God? Then why don't we? Oh, I don't want to offend God. Like, really, your anger will offend God? I don't want to hurt Him. Oh, really, your pity anger is going to hurt the big, mighty, powerful God? Who created anger, by the way? <laughs> Nothing should be alien to God. If you're feeling anger... And most likely, you're angry against God. Well, instead of turning to your isolation, shoulder colder, ignoring God, and allowing yourself to have this pity party and anger against God, I'm going to make you suffer for what you did not do by not letting you console me. It's funny, right? But that's what we do. We're so angry with God that we want to punish Him. I'm, I'm so mad at you that I'm not going to give you the joy of consoling me. And the Spirit of God is at hand to console you, yet you quench the Spirit by refusing His consoling love. Why? Because you're that angry with God. Now, if you take the anger and turn it into prayer, Put on the punching glove. Have at it with God. Give your best punches. Don't worry, I've done it many times and yet I haven't been struck by a lightning. I'm still here. 
But what I do is, after I'm done giving all the punches, and after they're low punches, because I am low, <laughs> you're supposed to be all loving and good and protecting, how come you don't? Have your tantrum, get let it all out, he couldn't handle it. But once you're done, stay in the ring with him. You're probably knocked down by your own experience of letting all the anger out and there stay. Because then now allow the Father to console you. Do not quench the spirit that's at hand to console you and to help you. A fourth one. Another warning here. It says, let's go now to the next one. Do not despise prophetic utterances. You know, when the Spirit works either directly or via second causes, he, he will find people to help you. So when you're sorrowful and sad, it's in our nature to want to console each other. And as good Christians, we, can, we should console each other and prompting our brothers and sisters who are in sorrow to renew themselves in our faith, the faith revealed to us in Christ Jesus, that there is life after death, that our loved one is in a better place, that we should be happy, that they're no longer suffering. Those are prophetic utterances in Christ Jesus because it's what Christ revealed to us. There is life after death. There is resurrection. But if you're not on check with your anger, the anger will say, Shut up! I want nothing to do with that! Because you're still angry at God. Angry about the church, faith, religion. And when someone utter a prophetic word to you, reminding you of life after death, you despise it. You, you say, here, do not despise the prophetic utterance. Now, one last thing. Test everything. Refrain, uh, retain what is good, refrain from every kind of evil. Test everything. Each one of us have unique ways of grieving because each personality is different. Something works, something doesn't work. Test it out. If doing something helps you in your sorrow and your grief, then do it. If it doesn't help you, if it's destroying you, if it's a, a, a way of self-destruction, then don't do that one. For example, anesthetizing the pains with drugs, alcohol, pornography, masturbation, sexualizing your emotions, overeating, gambling, entertainment, just being sucked into the social media, into TVs, into entertainment, those things, they don't work. You probably have experienced some of them and you could testify that if you put it to the test, it doesn't work. So why do you keep doing it? Look for the things that do help you. Exercise, talking to friends, writing in journal, doing artwork, uh, allowing yourself to be loved and supported, be close to loved ones who can help you and sustain us. Sing. The arts are such a beautiful way of healing. Music, dancing, singing, painting. Look for the one that helps you and do it. If it doesn't help you, then forget about it. But if it does, continue to practice it so that you can allow rejoicing to come into your heart. So this is the week we're supposed to be rejoicing. And a third of you probably have no reason why to rejoice. But rejoice can come into your heart. Joy can emerge from within you. Let's follow the guidance, the suggestions of Paul. Let's pray without ceasing. Actually, you, you tell it to me. What's the first one? Pray without ceasing. The second one? Give thanks. Give thanks in all circumstances. Three. Go back so that they can. Three. Do not quench the spirit. Four. Do not despise prophetic orange. And five. Has everything retained what is good and refrain from every kind of evil. I hope this week, in the midst of your sorrow and your grief, following the Paul's, the suggestions of Paul, you may be able to truly light up that rose candle in your hearts and in your home and be ready to receive the birth of our Lord Jesus Christ.